I'm Chuck Norris, and I approve this game. Between the time when gamers play with miniatures and chainmail, and the rise of the Wizards of the Coast, there was an age of advanced role-playing undreamed of. And onto the Skygax, destined to bear the jeweled crown of TSR upon a troubled brow. It was given to teach us all how to roll for initiative. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's get ready to rumble! Welcome to the Roll for Initiative podcast. This is volume number three, issue 144. DM Vince sitting here with DM Matt. Hello, everyone. DM Chad. Hey, yo. And DM Nick. Greetings, everyone. I guess, everyone, this is May the 4th be with you today. Yes. As of recording, it is May 4th. Yes, May the 4th be with you. And when you listen to it, it won't be May the 4th. (laughs) Yes, it won't. But tomorrow you can have Revenge of the 5th. (laughs) Oh, God. Say 5th. (laughs) Lord of the 5th. Yes. Only Sith speak in absolute. Mm Mm-hmm. So we have a wonderful show for you this week. Uh, before we get into things real quick, North Texas RPG Con coming up in June. Woohoo! The weekend of new of June, you can get come to the DFW area, Dallas Fort Worth area, and join in on the fun. Uh, lots of old school games going on from the seventies, eighties, and I think a little bit of the nineties. And um, are we considering nineties old school now? Yeah, apparently this time we have to. So, oh man, that means yeah. Shadowrun's old school. A Shadowrun is considered old school according to that convention, yes. I'll be damned. You'd have to play um, probably second or first edition, probably third edition Shadowrun might make it on that list depending on what era, what it, what year it was made. Oh, it's, Yeah, wow. it depends on what – I would consider FASA Shadowrun old school, but when you get into the Game Pro and WizKid Shadowrun, eh, not so uh, – Yeah, I was thinking the FASA one anyway. I mean probably like the original Cyberpunk game. And- yeah, yeah. Uh, you can even go. Let's see. I'm trying to think of other games that would probably have there. V and V will be there as well. Visions of Vigilante. Even though the new edition just came out, I think by Jeff D. Cool. Most excellent. Uh, that's allowed. It, it all. It all depends on who was designing the game, and, and that determines if it'll be there or not. Sweet. So I, obviously, if someone like Tim Cask came out with a new game, it would be there because you know Tim Cask. He's in because it's Tim Cask, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but if it was a game that was made by I don't know uh, <clears throat> Wizards of the Coast, it probably wouldn't be there. Uh, well, 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 you know, <laughs> <laughs> such as next or uh, uh, what? I don't What's think... next? What's next? Yeah. Are we talking about? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> You won't see Pathfinder there as well because they don't allow Pathfinder, even though Pathfinder does have that kind of old school feel to it a little bit. Mm. But no, you will not see it there. You'll see some Earth Dawn. I did see, a, I think, a game for that. Remember Earth Dawn by Fox? Yes, I do. Yeah. Mm. Pretty cool game. I've never played it. I've always wanted to, though. I've never really gotten to it either. I do have some of the second edition books, but uh, never actually got into it. I got one box at mm. length. Somewhere I can't see it on the shelf at the moment. Nah, whatever. Chad, you had some conventions you wanted to plug, right? Yeah, uh, you know, uh, two of which I'm, I think are really going to be good if you're up in the area around Wisconsin, um, uh, Madison, Wisconsin, or Milwaukee. Uh, right now, you can go ahead and see that in for June 19th through the 22nd uh, is the Nexus Game Fair in Milwaukee. And that one, the event uh, registration, the event guide is already up. So you can already see what's out there and, and get ready to re- and you can register. Uh, and you can also see they're going to have some really great special guests, including Tim Kask, uh, Frank Menser, Merle Rasmussen. Uh, and many, many more. Uh, and then you can also, I'd like to mention that uh, June, I'm, I'm sorry, November 7th through the 9th is Game Hole Con. And that one is going to feature Ed Greenwood, uh, creator of Elminster and the Forgotten Realms. 
as well as uh, Doug Niles, Ernie Gygax, Jolly Blackburn. And for that one, they are now accepting event registration. So there you go. Those are two. And that one's in Madison, Wisconsin. So those are two great conventions I think you, you should check out. Uh, one more convention, one more old school convention to plug. That's Oz Warp. Uh, that's going to be in the uh, New York, New Jersey area, that where area. July 4th to the 5th of this year. Uh, signups are starting up now. Just uh, Google Oz Warp. Uh, we'll put a link in there for that. If you're not looking at our show notes, you can just kind of Google it and you'll find it. It's pretty easy. Nat, uh, Nick, you had something as well? Yeah, I just like the talk about two other conventions coming up here locally in Ohio that you might look forward to going to. Obviously, Origins Game Fair, June 11th to the 15th. And a couple of weeks ago, they did release online the events uh, Excel spreadsheet. So you can head on over to the Origins website, originsgamefair.com, and you can download that and pick from all different events, uh, card games, role-playing, board games, you name it, miniature warfare, you got it. And uh, the uh, Origins author guest of honor is Tracy Hickman this year. Yay! So Tracy's going to be there. That'll be really, really cool. And, uh, yeah, it's going to be a really fun con. Uh, Some great... uh, Obviously, you know, sponsored by Mayfair every year, Real Grand Game, Steve Jackson, uh, Upper Deck, Reaper, Kenzer and Company. Mm-hmm. And uh, Geek Chic is now a, a sponsor of them. They've grown quite a bit over the past few years, Geek Chic. Oh, really? Yeah, they have yeah. their own promo at Origins, don't they? Mm-hmm. They sure do. And we were, in fact, it was, I think it was last year, we were trying to get into their Geek Chic uh, room over at the uh, Hyatt area where there's the big bar on two and down the way is they had this whole area of all their geek chic uh, tables that yeah, you, wasn't and, that, and you could wasn't rent time to play on one of their trying, tables. It wasn't that my game that we were trying to get I think that. it was, wasn't it? We no, were trying and, to get to one of those tables. We couldn't get to it. We couldn't get one because they filled up so fast. Oh but, my God. Uh, it was very crazy. popular. Yeah. So, yeah, that's well, hopefully I'm going to try that again this year. So I'm uh, hats off to Geek Chic being a sponsor of Origins. And uh, they're uh, the, I guess the theme this year is monsters. Mm. So last year they did superheroes. Mm. This year is monsters. So expect a lot of monster cosplay going on there. Not to be confused with monsters. Uh, Not monst- <laughs> you could go as You Herman could monster, monster cosplay there. Yes, you could, though. <laughs> I'll see if you can go as Thing. That would be awesome. Um, well, Thing is actually Adam's family. Yeah, oh, Adam's family. Hey, sorry, sorry. You could go as the, Adam's family too. That's you could go as Herman. Herman yes, Monster. Herman Monster. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and then, um, so that's Origins. And then October here in in uh, Hudson, Ohio is con on the cob and that is going on in october that is 16th through the 19th in hudson ohio and their special guests we got artist guest of honor fred fields who uh, did uh cover illustrations for tsr and wizards of the coast um larry elmore honored guest artist he goes every year now i think since the beginning and uh jolly blackburn is going to be media guest of honor so So that'll be very cool. I'm going to have to make the excuse and go there now since Jolly's going to be up in my neck of the woods. <laughs> very cool. Yeah, Con on the Cobb's another really fun convention. Yeah. I went so, one year and had a blast. I'm absolutely going to make the time available for myself to go that year, to go, to go this year. So. All right. Well, since we're plugging conventions, Gen Con, oh, let's not forget about that one. Yes. It's the big one is coming up in August. Obviously, if you're not signed up for that or don't know about it, kind of too late to sign up for that i think for at least for a good game at this point i don't know Matt, uh, the door? event schedule hasn't signups haven't started has it <laughs> yeah that? but what about hotel oh, yeah. you wanted to get that like a january 1st <laughs> you wanted to get that yeah. september 1st yeah of uh, last year yeah last year, yeah but with Gen Con, you could still get hotels if you're willing to walk a few blocks. Everyone wants that connected hotel where they don't oh, have yeah. to see sunlight for five days. That's me. 
So, you know, the last time uh, we went to Gen Con, Colin for the DGS, we had the we had the owners' suite at the nice. Canterbury. Ooh, Ooh nice, swanky. Yeah, we had a. It, it had two floors and one of those little twisty staircases. Ooh. Ah, Ooh. did it have the secret uh, like panel where you hit the 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 button and like a bar comes around and all that jazz? If it did, it was secret. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I remember yeah, the first year we went there uh, when RFI was there the first year, 2010, yeah. and I had a hotel that was a mile away. Jason had the Omni, I believe yeah, it was. Yeah, I was at the Omni that year too. And he said that they ran out of rooms and they wound up giving him this the master suite with a balcony. He's like, what am I going to do on a balcony? I'm here to play games. <laughs> <laughs> he had a balcony. He could sit out. He said he sat out there and had breakfast one morning just so he could use it. Yeah. yeah, I remember that. He told me about that. Uh, he said he would go out there in the mornings and have his coffee and look out over the city. I was like, oh, that that must be nice. Yeah. That yeah. sounds actually kind of worth it to me. I mean, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Might as well. He got it upgraded for free. So, hey, why not? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, huh? But I agree. Uh, the Westin, I stayed at one year also. That was the best. Uh, you just walk down the escalator. Boom. There's the convention. But nice. Matt, you told me they moved it now, right? Uh. The, no, actually, the Westin is still the best shot of going. Oh. It's just that the, instead of when you go down the escalators, you would turn right to go to the exhibit hall. Now you yeah. just go straight. Oh, that's huh? even better. Oh, that's even better. You don't right. It's actually, yeah. <laughs> um, right now, the probably the closest is the Crown Plaza because you cross the street, you go through the front doors, you're at the exhibit hall. Do uh, they still have the 10-foot pit trap still there? Uh, I haven't seen the 10-foot pit trap, but I've probably successfully dodged it. Oh, excellent. <laughs> I've yes. never seen it. I've dodged it myself, apparently. Did they ever get all the construction finished out yes, there? Yes. The construction is done. Uh, most of that was being done for the Super Bowl. And uh, However, this year the Canterbury is closed uh, because uh. they are remodeling it. And they're oh. doing a massive upgrade because... For those that haven't been in the Canterbury, their hallways are maybe wide enough for one person. Maybe. Yeah, there. It had a certain ambiance to it. it. Was a great place to play Call of Cthulhu. Oh yes, if you wanted, so, if you wanted to live in a hotel from the 1920s, the Canterbury was your place. Nice. Yes. The oh, rooms yeah. were the size of a small studio in New York. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I can vouch for that. I stayed the, the year before we stayed in the president's suite. I stayed in a regular room. It was quite small. Right. Um, they, you, there's enough room for your bed, a wardrobe, and a slight path in between the wardrobe and bed. Because I yeah, stayed there one year too. You're gaming. You don't need to be in your room. But you it's there to put your stuff. It's there yeah. to put. Your but stuff. there's not even that much room to put your stuff. It's so small. Wow. Well, you, College <laughs> dorm seems like an upgrade. And wow. when it comes to space, put your stuff in the dresser, Matt. There's your answer. And then in the one year I stayed there, I woke up. I had no water. The entire all the water for my floor was out. So you blended in with the rest of the gamers. The rest yeah. Of the game. Yeah. I, yeah, I they're like, say. well, we have other rooms open on another floor. If you need to go take a shower, I'm like, OK, what if I need to go to the bathroom? Suddenly I'm in a European hostel. Exactly. <laughs> I share the time I'm in showers. a European hostel that's costing me like $1,000 for four days. Nice. And it was also, if I remember, like right next to the, uh, to the motorcycle rally. Yeah. Yeah, it was right along that path. Bikers and gamers. What could possibly what a mix. go wrong? Well, yeah. the first year, the MotoGP. Just I... had alcohol and watch the fun. <laughs> I was actually at the Homewood Suites, which is right in front of where they were parking all their motorcycles. I was so you on... heard this all night. <laughs> um, I was on the third floor. My windows were rattling. <laughs> there were seven officers in the hotel lobby. Oh they God. were checking names as you walked in to make sure you were actually staying there. I could. I had a view of the street from my room. Yeah, I could. They were checking who was on the 100 most wanted list of the FBI, but yeah. they didn't tell you that. Yeah, it was, I could watch, look out upon all the chaos, and I saw. Let's see, someone get hit by a motorcycle, uh, people vomiting in the street. It was fun times. Fun times. Oh. Um, yeah. The only problem the- is I was on the other side of the 
sh- block from where the convention center was, so I had to cross that street, which they blocked that street off just for the motorcycles, and I was pretty much told, cross at your own risk. <laughs> nice. Then the Mongols and the RPGA had a throwdown. Yes. The the Mongolians came to uh, thrash their city walls. It was the Hell's Angels. Get it right. Yeah, the outlaws. They both live in yurts. What's the difference? It, it wouldn't really matter. I mean, it would have been a quick fight to be, no matter yeah. which oh, yeah. outlaw gang it was. Yeah. Yeah. They would have just took out your sword and they would have just got them. That's right. <laughs> the, RPG, the one group's throwing bean bags at them. Magic missile, magic missile, <laughs> lightning bolt, lightning bolt, lightning bolt. Th- that's where you actually have to call in the acronistic Mongols on horseback. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. Okay. Oh, <laughs> Meanwhile, but... <laughs> Meanwhile, back at the... Oh, never mind. Little Ted Knight Halls of Justice for you. Yes. <laughs> Meanwhile, at the Halls of Justice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Could he sound more annoyed doing that? I mean, come yes. on. <laughs> anyway, so um, that's that, and let's head into our first segment. Typical of all the evil creatures in the world, I'd like to find one with table manners. What are you kidding me? I spent years cultivating the worst table manners on the planet. Table manners. Okay, here we are in Tables Manners, and we're going to... I think we did one of these uh, types of books before by uh, by Fitz. Brian Fitz, Fitzpatrick, and we're going to cover one of the big books. And this one's the big book of Little Spaces, Haunts. Basically, yeah. it's like about like a 19 or 20 page PDF on how to spice up a an area, a room, hallway, whatever it is, to kind of give it a creepy, haunted mm. uh, kind of feel to it. And it's a very cool book. Yeah, you can use it for, for anything. Any, any yeah. type of game. It's system neutral, so you can use it for Ravenloft Adventures or if you were playing Raven, uh, Shadowrun, anything. It works yeah. really well. Yeah, a this would work your... wonderfully for chill. Call yeah, Cthulhu. Chill, call Cthulhu, you name it. A place where you're probably going to run into some undead, some creepiness, some weirdness. This is a cool little uh, cool little big book. You want to I guess you might want to call it. So uh I guess what what you do with the book, I guess the easiest way to, to explain it is there's you have your senses, your you know, hearing touch, taste, sight, and smell, and then you roll off to see which one is going to get the effect, I suppose, and the descriptive element, you're going to find out what that might be on a table, and then something specific about what's happening with that sense, what you're sensing from that item or area or whatever that may be. I guess that's the best way to describe it, and you could come up with some really interesting results. (laughs) Mm. Some pretty cool results. Yeah, in fact, what I love about it is is because uh, you know, I, Nick, I know you and I both uh, made some uh, some of our own uh, using this book. We made some of our own rooms, but I love mm-hmm. the fact you get these results that at first you think are just completely disjointed, but then as you put them together, you end up with these really cool rooms that you never would have thought of on your own, but they just work. I mean, right? The, it's the disjointedness of the elements that make them so creepy. Yeah, and it's not even just rooms. It could be objects. It could be an area. Um, it could be just a hallway. Um, so, yeah, it goes even just beyond the rooms. And... <laughs> And there's all these different things that – so many different combinations that you could come up with. Either – you can you, – I'm sure you can cherry pick things, but it's so much more fun to, to roll because, you know, we have dice. We're gamers, and by God, we're going to use them. So. Right, and like you said, if you didn't want to use the dice, I mean it's neat even from uh, – you know, because you're going to see things you may not have thought of. So mm-hmm. if you didn't want to use the dice, it's still very valuable because – you may see someone and be like, wow, that's cool. Okay, I want to use that. Uh, I wouldn't have thought of it on my own, but now I want to use it. So either way, it's going to be very valuable to uh, creating your adventures. Right, right. And one of the things that I like about it is 
it, even though when I was going through this, some of the, it seemed kind of chaotic and disjointed, but I'm like, yeah, you know what? That actually kind of adds to the horror creepiness of the whole thing. Mm-hmm. So, cause it's so weird, out of place, chaotic. So I guess what, what I did is I did the first table. I rolled the D eight for which sense, mm-hmm. and you know, you have your standard sight, hearing, smell, touch, taste, and then, and it's a D eight roll, but you have chances you can roll again, roll twice, or roll three times. So this stuff could stack up on you. So my first one, I rolled for hearing, okay? Mm-hmm. So that's my sense that's going to be affected. Then I went to the, I guess what would be the descriptive element. I just went right down the PDF, and I just chose, I went to ghostly effects. So the second one, you rolled a d20. Yep. yep. And this one was toys. So something with hearing and toys. Okay, so we start to form this creepy toy, maybe making a noise in the room as you right. creep to the room. And then I went to the actual hearing uh, chart, which is, I believe, on page 13 of it, and I did a D100 roll. So, okay, what am I hearing about these toys? And the roll came up solemn. So something solemn. So you see there's these toys. You're hearing something, but it's a solemn sort of sound. Okay. So, like, now you go with it. What's the – how do you tie all that together? (laughs) How would you tie that together, Nick? You know, I was thinking about that. I was was thinking maybe, like, it was – uh, maybe it, just some sort of room, mm-hmm. like maybe, maybe a, um, maybe in an abandoned house, maybe in a child's room, and you see, you open this box, like a toy chest. Yeah. Okay. And you see all these toys, like, you know, maybe a a, a toy soldier, um, a teddy bear, maybe a toy boat, but they're all put in their perfectly placed, nothing stacked on each other. They're all perfectly stacked. And you, and as you're listening, you hear somewhere in the background, this solemn sort of maybe a moan or groan. So (laughs) that's how I kind of toyed, put it together. You can do that whole thing of you creep into the room and you see all these weird looking burnt dolls all across the room. Look like someone was collecting them but burned in the fire. And then you hear the very sad song in the background of one, two, Freddy. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> no! Well, kind of works if you think about it. But, you it know, does kind of yes. work. <laughs> see? That's one of the things when you get all these together. Yeah. It's like your imagination, uh, like in a couple seconds, is starting to work. So, like something with that for, for you, Matt, how would that work? Hearing the ghostly effects is toys, but solemn. How would, how would you work that together? When, whenever I think of toys, I, o- I always, my mind, and especially in a creepy environment, I always go to like, Creepy doll, the creepy doll with the big eyes sure. staring at you, and in like tops. For whatever reason, when I think creepy, I think top because no child plays with a top now. You know? Yeah, no. So, not. so it's like a throwback to like an older time, having like okay. having like the porcelain doll yeah. with like a top next to it, and then, Ooh. yeah, and then you just hear this little like. Like maybe it's coming from the doll, maybe it's not. Or and maybe when you spin the top, top. it's this it's kind of solemn. solemn. Right. It, it's, it's almost sad. like a. Uh, I'm, I'm hearing like uh like maybe like a monk chant, like the Gregorian there chants. You, oh, when you spin the top, top it's, it's like. Some, ooh, that's creepy. I just got chills. Yeah. <laughs> that's good. That's good. <laughs> yeah. So then it becomes where is this why does this top make this chanting sound and why is this doll staring at you no matter where you stand yeah what about what about you chad wake think you could do with that 
Uh, you know, I was thinking about that. What if, what if your character walks into a room uh, and it's obviously a child's room uh, and what they see are, you know, it used to be, obviously it was a girl's room and there are dolls in the room, uh, but w- there's also a music box and the music box is open and it's playing a song, but it's a funeral dirge. Oh, wow. And oh. As, as it starts <laughs> to play this f- solemn funeral dirge, they turn and they see that the dolls, there are tears coming down the doll's eyes. Oh, uh, man. I just, you just creeped me out. <laughs> That's good. Oh. It, that would be it, you know. Uh, oh, my gosh. That's that would be how man. I would. But again, I never thought of that until you just literally just mentioned those elements. And, so and that's one of the great things about this, this big book, this little big book, you know, it's 19 pages of great imagination kickoff right there. Yeah. Right. So, oh it, man. You know, that's here's the thing stuff. too. It doesn't have to be that everything you roll is centralized in one object. They're saying it's centralized within one room. So Mm -hmm. the solemn sound doesn't have to come from the toy itself. So in my case, I said, okay, well, there are dolls in here, so that's a toy. Mm -hmm. Uh, And and obviously the music box is a toy too. Sure. Uh, But, uh, you know, and don't, you know, you shouldn't feel like with this book you have to confirm find yourself to only what you roll uh in, my, in the case of what i rolled i i felt free to add things to it sure uh, because what you're doing is you're you're rolling to build your foundation and right then, this is it, to kick off your imagination exactly and then once you have your foundation feel free at that point to, to grab other things or just you just make up something else yeah. go along with what you have because this is it. this is not the end all of what you're creating for this room this is your starting point this is getting mm-hmm. your, you going so you know uh what your elements they're just these are various elements of the room itself right that all tie together uh, to create the greater effect. Okay. Uh, so mm-hmm. I know you did one. Yeah, uh, I did Of one. a room. So what did you do? Okay. I rolled uh, and I got uh, sensory touch. Okay. Uh, plus ghostly. And uh, in, in, in this one, uh, it, was, uh, it was animal. Uh, and then, uh, it was, and then it, I, I, it came down to, I think it was on the hundred sider, I think, uh, where I got, uh, uh, clammy Ooh. and under, and then ghostly foggy effects also, because I rolled, uh, I think I rolled a, uh, one of those roll twice. So uh-huh. I yeah, I got one of those too. Yeah. And they do start to stack up a little bit. Yeah, they can. So, when, so then I just put it into a little short uh, uh, descriptor for a room after I thought about it for a minute. And it says, okay, passing through the diaphanous veil of fog, you make your way out across an old pier. Its slick rotting timbers dull your footsteps to muted thuds. Further out, you can hear the breakers crashing against an ancient stone wharf, once a busy quay but deserted now by all but the crabs. You have not gone more than perhaps 10 feet when you first feel a light touch. Brush your leg. Though it's so fleeting and so light that perhaps it's only a product of your imagination. However, it is quickly followed by a second. This time it is the caress of a hand at your neck. It's touched chill and clammy and accompanied by the briny smell of the sea's dark depths. Oh, now how come I'm thinking of Innsmouth? (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. I'm I'm thinking of deep ones. (laughs) Yeah. And so again... You're taking a few of the things that you rolled and you're adding a few more things that you think go along with it. And, you know, like uh, touch, when I first got touch and, you know, an animal, uh, you know, my first thought was touch. That's an odd sensory. How am I going to add that into a room's right. description? You know, and then and I got fog and I thought, oh, what if something touched them while they're in the fog and they can't see it? Mm. And uh, then I started to think, uh, oh, and you know what? I, I didn't – I tried to write some of these things on top of it that I'd rolled, but I forgot to write. The briny uh, – or actually, yeah, I think briny was a, uh, a smell too that I'd gotten or something like that. And So anyway, uh, or maybe I just chose it on my own. But that's how I decided to make it out on an, on an old pier, 
you know, within. And so then I started thinking because see, these things get you thinking. And when, when you right. start to think about that, you start to think uh, it was probably clammy that made me think about it. But then you start to think about old pier. OK, rotting wood. OK, sure. rotting wood is like what does it sound like when you walk over rotting wood? It's kind of soft, right? I yeah. mean, it it's your, kind of soft, maybe a squishy sound to it. Almost. Yeah, yeah. It kind of dulls your footsteps and, and mm-hmm. you're walking through the and you know, what mist and fog rises up off the sea, you know, and you would hear out in the you know, you'd hear the breakers coming in out there, you know, and. It would just have this whole, you know, briny, and it makes you kind of think of death by drowning, you know? Sure. Crabs, what do crabs? They eat the bodies of drowned sailors, you know? Yeah. So that's how that all, and so I just tried to come up with something that tied everything together to come up with an overall feel. That's really good. I don't know if I could come up with anything that topped that. <laughs> no. I mean, but anybody, though, you can tie these things and you just think about it, you know, I mean, like, uh, and, and it's it's one of those one thing leads you to another thing. Right. You know? and, and what is this? Well, what does this make me think of? Or what does that make me think of? And then once you have it and, you know, I actually started to think uh, because I like to write. I, I enjoy writing. And and sometimes I get writer's block. And I actually thought, you know, this this book could actually be better than just for gaming. If I get yeah. Writer's right. block. I'm going to go to this book. Wow. I never thought of that. That's actually <laughs> – wow. That's pretty good. Right. Yeah. This is this book could be used as a creative writing exercise. You roll in the charts. There's your writing prompt. Go. Oh, my gosh. Educational application right there with the English. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Nick, oh you did a, Did you do any others? Oh, I did. Yeah, I got one. Um, like you said, how some of these things can stack on each other. Mm-hmm. Well – one of mine I, I rolled, and it was for two senses, touch and taste. Yeah, okay. hit us with it. So touch and taste, the descriptive element. I went to the very next one uh, after Ghostly Effects. I went to Scary Basements, and I rolled Storage. So something in storage, touch and taste, in the specific sense description, cottony and syrupy. Huh, now, how do you tie those together? Uh, how do you, yeah, that's a weird one. Cottony and syrupy, it's touch and taste, and the scary basement thing, storage. What I was thinking, okay, you are, maybe it's in a uh, warehouse, and that's compartmentalized like many warehouses and several storage facilities, okay? And let's say it's some sort of, Weird Call of Cthulhu adventure. Well, weird, some sort of weird call. That's kind of redundant. But uh, Call of Cthulhu <laughs> adventure, and you're looking for some information about uh, something in this that led you to this warehouse. And you go to one of these storage areas, and you find in some boxes, so inside these boxes, there are some plastic. Well, I guess jars, they're, they're white, they're plastic containers. And you open up one of the containers and there is this kind of cottony looking material. But it doesn't look quite, it, it looks really puffy, more puffy than cotton. And you smell and taste it and it has a syrupy kind of very sweet taste to it, almost like cotton candy. So there's all these containers of cotton candy in this storage facility. <laughs> I don't uh, know. <laughs> there could you could do something. Why would they? Or or is it some other? It tastes like something like else. A weird cotton candy, or is it something else? Maybe something tied into the adventure. That maybe it's some sort of drug, but it takes the form of cotton candy, and they're giving it to kids. And you're trying to crack the case on this one. And it has some weird psychedelic effects. And they start to see things <laughs> which aren't there. Or are they there? We Maybe all float th- down here. <laughs> yes. That's the quote from it. <laughs> oh, my God. Now I'm thinking of Pennywise. Maybe it's some sort of weird clown monster. He gives this cotton candy to these kids. <laughs> yes. oh, it floats. It floats. <laughs> 
gosh. Well, okay. See stuff. now, yeah, that's good. So maybe it's maybe this weird cottony syrupy substance is tied into the adventure, like some sort of weird hallucinogenic drug. Ah, you yeah. know, what yeah. if uh, in the lows? I don't know. <laughs> what if you combined them uh, and say? In a more, you could say we wanted to put it in, in more of a D&D type setting and we, we could say, OK, you enter, uh, you, you know, you, you find this tunnel that, that seems to slope downwards. It's, it's fairly narrow. Uh, it looks to be about maybe roughly four feet in diameter. Uh, moving down it, uh, you notice uh, the feel. It's dark. Uh, but the feel of the of the tunnel has a, a very cottony feel uh, almost along the edges. It's uh, like cobwebs in a way. Yeah, very <laughs> has a cottony texture, and and as you reach uh, what you think uh, may be the the bottom, uh, you can't help but notice that your hands. Uh, when you the, the touching the the edges leaves your hands. Coated in an in a syrupy stickiness. Ooh. Ah. Oh, okay. You know that's you, good. That's you know, good. And now you're starting to the people are starting to wonder. You know what like, are what where are, have we gotten ourselves <laughs> into? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you know, are or we maybe going down the gullet of some monster. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or or maybe you find yourself uh, entangled within a mass of cottony material. You know, this cottony uh, mass, uh, and uh, as you're struggling to free yourself, uh, a syrupy substance uh you can feel a syrupy uh you know liquid dripping down upon you from above oh yeah maybe it's like some sort of trap yeah, yeah. maybe you, you go down there and maybe you fall into a room like like full of this cottony syrupy material and you can't break free <laughs> maybe maybe this the syrupy stuff is some sort of saliva of something above Ooh. you some it's it's the digestive juices <laughs> could be yeah. what do you guys think what do you think matt what do you think vince well what i what i was thinking when i heard warehouse i started thinking seeing all these barrels just mm. like a, like a maybe like an old wine vault bottom of a tavern where they keep the barrels of ale and as mm-hmm. you're you're going down and you're walking through it one of the barrels is leaking and it's flowing out it's like a syrupy it looks syrupy and it's flowing, but when you touch it, it's actually granular. It's got that cottony feel to it. Weird. Even though it it looks like it's syrup, and when you put it to your mouth, it's sweet to taste. So. And then that's where you say, well, "Save versus poison." Please. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> the sweet smell of the cotton candy lures you into the room. As you dip your finger into it, it looks gooey, smells good, but tastes bitter when you touch it with your tongue. Oh, there's your save. Yeah. <laughs> save versus poison, sucker. Okay. That's yes. right. <laughs> yes, little did you know that the little cottony things you were feeling in the syrup were actually little parasites that have infested all these barrels. Oh, nice. man. Oh, wow, that's good. <laughs> Just the a con- spoonful of sugar helps the poison. <laughs> go down. There you go. Yes, oh, as you hear God. some evil children skipping in the room and laughing as they run out the door. With, running out with that evil looking clown. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice and warm in here. Yeah. <laughs> oh, nice. Undead well, Mary Poppins walks out of the room. Yeah. <laughs> I'll give you a, I'll give you a one more that I did. I did two of these. So uh the other one I did here now uh was okay, this is an example again where at first I kind of thought, well, this is an odd one because two of these traits seem to be at odds with one another, but uh a sensory I got was hearing and so I rolled uh on the hearing chart to see what was heard. And it was exhale. Okay. So then I also had another sense. Uh, so I rolled on that. It was smell. 
And it uh, this was another one. This was one where I I rolled and first I got two and then it, it well it said roll again and I, this one actually I got to roll three times. Wow! On the sensory table, so I got hearing and then I got two smells. Uh, so I got exhale, smell, and smell, and and they were exhale. Uh, I'm sorry, hearing, smell, and smell, and it was in this order: exhale, putrid, and sweet. Uh, and then I also got bugs and garden from, I think, ghostly effects and locations. So, okay. So we have exhale, putrid, sweet bugs Mm. and garden. Uh, Uh, so then what I did, oh, and I, and granite, I think I may have chosen granite, but anyway, uh, so then basically reads like this. Okay. It's again, it's a room description. So. Standing within the garden, you can see that at one time this would have been a marvelous testimony to the creativity of man, a garden masterfully sculpted to uh, to control nature's raw beauty. Now the sculpted trees sag, barren of leaf, and the flowers have long since wilted back into the ground. The birds, which once took their fill upon the nectar of the sweet fruit, have been replaced by large black beetles feeding upon the putrid remains of things no longer identifiable. Where once the garden was filled with the sweet smells of fruit, there is now only the the smell of rot. And in the center, there is a great slab of granite which sits embedded into the soft earth, perhaps having once served as a monument to the garden's creator. Kneeling down, you can see runes inscribed upon the stone, though they are now much disfigured by age and what appears to be the acts of a more sentient force. From the other side of the slab, you hear a sharp exhale. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. But, you know, it's enough to have the party suddenly, you know, almost jump back because it's almost love. I, I try. Yeah, I, I almost kind of look to Lovecraft. Mm-hmm. for, for yeah. the manner because he has a style oh know? he does and, and he loved to have that that quick kind of gotcha at the end mm-hmm. of his stuff you know like i love the story he wrote uh which i can't think of the name of it you might know it offhand nick but it's the one where uh randolph carter uh goes uh to uh it's one of the early randolph carter ones where he mm-hmm. actually uh goes tomb robbing <laughs> Oh, with gosh. Yeah, which friends. one is that? I think it was a statement either. of Randolph. Carter. I think it was a statement of Randolph Carter. Yeah. Right, and uh, and and he's uh, he's got like a two way radio system going on, and he's up above while his uh, mentor is is down in the in this tomb, and they're talking to each other, and 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 somehow he you know he loses contact with the guy. And and he keeps saying, you know, are you there? Are you there? And suddenly a different voice answers him back and says, you know, something like, Chumley is dead, you fool. And then he cuts <laughs> off. Yes. And that's it. Uh, you know, and, and that's the, and I always remember that that always shook me when I was young mm-hmm. and I read that because you, what he's doing is he's saying, you know, there's something else down there. Yeah. You know, and Chumley is dead, you fool. Wow. <laughs> and, uh, and so exhale the, I, from the tomb. Yeah, so obviously on the other side of this this basically flat rock, it, it, it's telling the character several things. It's more it's more than a rock. It's it's mm-hmm. obviously a door of some sort, uh, and it's telling them that perhaps it's a grave, and it's telling them that perhaps whatever is behind there is still alive, mm-hmm. uh, and it makes them start to wonder, well, what tried to disfigure the marks on the grave? Because you know it says, you know, it's not just time that is has partially erased these marks; something else has too, right? You know, and, and why? So now they're they are, should they try to let this thing out? You know, is it good? Is it bad? They don't know. Uh, you know, so you're trying to throw a lot of things at the characters at once uh, to make them think. Uh, so hopefully that would hopefully that that room description would do it. Yeah. But again, I wouldn't have thought of putting those elements together if I hadn't first rolled them up using this yeah. chart. <clears throat> yeah, like I said, it just it's a great jump off point for your imagination. It really gets things going. Um, and some of these could be mm. seem rather simple, too. But you could put them in a way to where they could be just a little more complex. Like like this other one I rolled up. I rolled up one, the the sense is hearing. In the descriptive element, I went right down again. I went to abandoned places. And this time, a 
a burial, maybe like a burial mound or something like that. And the sense description for the hearing is a boom. So mm. a loud boom. Mm. So you got sense hearing, the abandoned place is burial, and boom. So what I was thinking, uh, just to kind of kick it off and we'll kind of go around the table here and see what else everybody goes into, maybe it's a um, – Let's tie this into World of Greyhawk. Let's right. say uh, your adventuring party is going off to the north of the city of Greyhawk to the Cairn Hills. And they go into one of these old abandoned cairns of long dead kings and, and tribal leaders. And they go into one of these, these burial mounds, these tombs. And as they open it up... And they go inside. The door crashes down behind them with a loud boom. <laughs> and that's – you can go, keep it as simple as that. Oh, yeah. I, so let's Definitely. go around the table. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'll start then, I guess. And then we'll yeah. go to Matt and then we'll end up with Chad. Sure. So you said it was hearing a loud boom as in the – go ahead. And and the abandoned places was a burial place, maybe like a burial mound or right, a mausoleum right. or something like that. As you file, you could do something like as you finally make your way into the room, peeling back the door that was there for centuries, holding back the stench. Well, no, there's no smell, but you can add it in as you want. Sure, the stench of maybe decay and uh, of rotting meat. You step into the room and you. Uh, Light your torch. As you light your torch, you see two large, horrifying statues there that just seem to be moving, but they just fall to the ground with a big, loud thud. And there's, oh. there's a couple mummies ready to attack you. Oh, oh man. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> All right, Matt. Run with it, buddy. Okay. The Yeah, the party is traveling through the forest, and as it progresses... The wild, the plant life seems to be older, a little more decrepit, more decay. The the greenery is wilting, and uh, it just you start to get this overwhelming just feeling of life uh, being sucked out of this area, and it start they come upon a clearing. It's actually a hill, and the party goes to the top of the hill to get a better idea of their surroundings. And as they walk up, it, it's not, it's a rather, it's a rather smooth hill. It's almost like a dome. And as they walk to the top of it, there is a loud, and get to its peak, there's a loud crash and they collapse into the hill. Uh-huh. As they, and they find themselves inside a burial mound. Wow, there you go. Okay, that's filled, cool. Filled with ET car. Oh, never mind. Yeah. <laughs> filled with ET cartridges. Phone <laughs> home. Phone <laughs> home. We found them, guys. The adventure's over. <laughs> All right, Chad. What do you got? All right. Let's see here. Uh, okay. Having finally manhandled the large block of marble away from the tomb's roughly hewn entrance, you turn your head as a gust of putrid tomb gas rushes past, then descending the dusty steps of, of the mausoleum, you make your way down two flights that, dis- that turn back upon one another until finally reaching the bottom landing. As you light a sputtering uh, uh, torch set within an iron sconce, you are just about to step forward towards a uh, towards a rune covered uh, sarcophagus when above when from up above you hear a low uh, a low rumble as of something heavy being moved and followed by a loud boom as what must what can only be the marble uh, stone is rolled back into place quick uh, with a force uh, with force 
applied by with more force applied than that uh, which could be given by man. Ooh. <laughs> and the torches <laughs> sputter and give out, leaving you back in and, the darkness. Well, luckily, I'm with Indiana Jones. <laughs> we can yeah. get through the wall with all those snakes coming through. <laughs> And you know what, by the way, I've, you know, I just realized I never gave you guys opportunities to come up with stuff with the elements that I chose, uh, which, you know, I apologize for. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I was just curious. What do you guys think you would do with uh, some of the ones I did? Well, let's go back over real quick. Was, yeah, the last yeah, one that I'll you did. throw them at you real quick. Uh, how about the last one? Uh, yeah. Uh, hearing XL, smell putrid, smell sweet, bugs and garden. Hmm. Yeah, I've got to think about that one for a few minutes here. Bugs and Garden. Exhale putrid. You know, I'm thinking... I'm thinking maybe... I, I'm For some reason, I'm thinking like a almost like a jungle landscape. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe you... Uh, the, the party has come across... A uh, an abandoned, like almost, um, some something like uh, if you're familiar with the module Hidden Shrine of Tomoachan, something mm-hmm. very Aztec or uh, me- Mesoamerican like in structure. Either uh, it's like maybe an abandoned temple or something like that, and the vines uh, are growing all over this thing. And they they're giving off this putrid stench uh, of, of almost like death that are on what is to believe you believe is this one cursed temple from a long forgotten civilization that you're sent to find the great MacGuffin. So <laughs> <laughs> and you find the entrance and as you open the entrance, it's as if uh the the exhale of a thousand years of dead corpses waft across your body. Mm. Uh, yeah, okay. I like that because I like the idea, I think, with a jungle setting. Because, you know, when it says garden, you don't have to necessarily take things literal. You right. Know? You, could, you could say garden, garden, okay, floral, uh, jungle, you know, forest. Okay, it doesn't have to be doesn't have to be sculpted garden per se. It could be wild uh, and and sweet oh, and putrid. Oh, lots oh yeah, of- and and the bugs that are crawling all over this temple are just not quite right. They're not your normal beetles or centipedes. There's something distorted, strange, maybe even sinister about them. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I almost forgot the bugs. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Vince? I was thinking about that. Uh, I was thinking maybe you would you you're in this kind of creepy, I don't know, house. I want to say house. Okay, house here. You're down the hallway. You come to this door, and there's some weird smell coming from it. It's kind of like an outside smell, like you're in the forest. Maybe, maybe could be a jungle smell. I'm going to go with forest. Okay. You open the door and you see all these overgrown plants in there and these vines and various overgrown plants I'm going to go with. Yeah, that works. Overgrown plants. Okay. You walk in the room, you hear some crunching noises and you're like, what's that? It's very dark in the room. You light your torch and this you start smelling something very foul and then you hear this <sighs> as it blows across your torch and your face and then this weird smell comes out as you hear a clicking sound in the background as you look up at the ceiling you see this giant beetle bug come flying down onto you Ooh. Ooh. oh okay there's your bugs that i yeah. got it oh yeah. that's, a, okay. that's a good way use that to start off an encounter i like yeah. that you can use the waff as maybe the bug uh kind of letting out its scent to mark you or something Ooh, mm-hmm. yeah, even better. Yeah. So I like to use the bugs as to create a, a monster encounter. That's good. Yeah. That's mm-hmm. good. Very nice. What about you, Matt? Yeah. yeah, Matt. Well, what I'm seeing is the party's traveling along, and they come across this garden. It's perfectly manicured. The flowers are in full bloom. It's a sweet smell. 
It's just the thing of beauty. Oh. They have little. They have the little ladybugs crawling on. Oh, I like ladybugs. Bugs. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it's yeah. just this pristine butterflies garden. Oh. And then they hear this loud. <sighs> And this putrid stench just overtakes the garden, Ugh. wiltering every flower and plant in it to instant death. Nick, what you mean? <laughs> mm. What if? What if they they uh, the the party comes upon this be- beautific scene like you are like you're kind of describing yeah. that. Mm-hmm. And 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 there's this sweet smell, and I'm kind of actually now I'm taking kind of elements of all your guys' situations, right? Yeah. Uh, say they're you know they're in this they they've traveled through this dense jungle region, right? Uh, and they they come upon the these ruins, this ruins of a of a garden, and and it's beautiful though. It's like this clearing, right? And uh, and and there's a sweet smell in the air, and, and and it's just it fills them with this longing desire to be within, to just to rest within this area. And this is just you know this would be a just a wonderful place to just sit and lay down and and fall to sleep and and just stay forever. And, and then somebody you know then you turn to the party and say everybody give me a roll, uh you know wisdom check. And if they make it, you say, you kind of pull them to the side, you say, you hear a clicking sound. And you start to notice that there's a somewhat, beyond, beyond the sweet smell, there's, there's, you're starting to smell more of a putrid smell, you know, uh, coming off from, say, a corner, you know, maybe behind a, a large stone or something. And they look and you say, there's all these bones, Ooh. And then they go, I, and then you say, okay, <clears throat> you look up and you see the big beetle coming down the side of one of the trees. <laughs> Ooh. Hey, there right? you go. Ooh. So what they've done is, you know, it's, it's lures people in with this sweet smell and beatific scene, you know, garden it, you know, but it's, this, it's actually, you know, there's the putrid smell of its, of its past meals, you know, of this giant bug. Mm-hmm. So really, what I did there was take their elements, but your guys' stories, and I just wow. combined them all. That's good stuff. Cool. Yeah. yeah. So, what do we give this for rating wise? Using, I guess we use our. What are we using? Swords, right? Swords out of five. Nick. I. Yeah. Sorry. Oh my gosh. Um. I, I I have to say I'd have to give it five swords. Five swords. Got just it. Just the 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 utility of it is amazing and we've already touched on it not even just to use for gaming purposes this could be used educational purposes for like for for writing uh for creative writing uh or if you're you're a writer that's stuck <laughs> this is a great jump off point for some of those things so Absolutely. and it's so multi faceted not just for one particular game system so i got to give it 5 out of 5 so swords okay Chad, I give it five because exactly for the same reason that Nick said, it, it goes beyond just gaming. It's it's useful in many different areas of creative, you know, creativity. Uh, I, you know, you could, it's you're, it's it's invaluable for creating games, creating on the spot situations that that look like. I mean, you could create something quickly with this that will have your players thinking that you plan this out way ahead of time, mm-hmm. uh, and then when the game's done, you can use it for other hobbies that you have that that involve uh creative writing uh it's it's just neat and you know i like it it's fun to do and it, it's just fun to do yeah. you know to, yeah, it to is. Pull stuff up so i gotta give it five all right i'd love to see him do this for not just scary stuff but just you know it'd be fun to do this for futuristic stuff anything mm-hmm. like that you know mm-hmm. matt yep i have to go with five as well i mean this is just a wealth of creativity waiting to be pulled out of you. Yeah. You, uh, the And plus, I like the layout of it. It's everything, all the chart is self-contained on one page. You're not doing a lot of excess flipping for just if, say, you're rolling horde hallways. 
it's all on one page and even has some examples and some art. So if you're a little stuck on how to use like the table, like, oh, you have these things, there's examples of this is how the author would use, uh, like if you had like a sight sky disturbed as you enter the foreboding tree line, you turn behind you only to watch the sky suddenly darken with a thunderstorm, just little descriptive blurbs like that. It's just a great product, and it's three ninety nine mm-hmm. on Drive Through RPG. So it's a bargain. Yeah, absolutely. You're definitely going to get your money's worth out. Yeah, of it. you're getting best uh, bang for your buck out of this. I even thought of another application to use this. This in itself could be used as a party game. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, mm-hmm. I just thought of that. I'm like, sort of like you know, like fiasco. Uh, like, like yeah, gestures, fiasco. Uh, some of those other games, you're given these elements. And maybe in 20 words or less, you write up what all these elements, how they are tied together. And whoever comes up with the best little 20 words or less thing with all these elements, uh, they went around. So oh, there yeah, you go. That'd be very so cool. you could use this as a party game. <laughs> very much so. And you know what? At the end of the day, what I hope happens if people start using this is that, you know, you do it enough using this book i think in the end you can't help but become better as a as a uh, as an adventure writer you know even when you're not using it you're going to walk mm-hmm. away after a certain point writing simply writing better room descriptions yeah oh, definitely I, i'm going to give this a five out of five fitz comes through yet again with a wonderful product yes he right to drive through rpg pick this up there's also a, a video a 12 minute video where he explains and goes through the book with different uh, ways to use this book. Oh, no so, kidding. On YouTube? Uh, right on. It's a YouTube video he posted right on the uh, drive through RPG link, which Matt put in the notes for everybody. Oh, excellent. And uh, you can purchase it and watch the video, and he explains how to use it in detail and what he has some examples. It's perfect to use. Pick it up now. No, not right now, but after yeah, you don't. Well, you know what? Fitz has figured out a great way to, to, to market this product. A how-to video? Wow. Yeah. Uh, pause this podcast, go purchase it, and come back. There you go. <laughs> we'll wait. We'll wait, yes. Do, 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 All right, so we, everyone gives it a five. It's wonderful five out of five swords for the entire podcast. Go pick it up. Uh, and let's head into our last segment. Are you saying that I put an abnormal brain into a seven and a half foot long <laughs> gorilla? Creature Feature Theater. It's alive! It's alive! And now we go into the Creature Feature, and we're going to talk about a creature that you could actually fit into some of the settings we described earlier with the book. Just what I was thinking. <laughs> yes. For this, it's a slime creature, but it's not the typical like green slime or the slimes you're used to coming across. Is it syrupy and cottony? (laughs) No, but it could potentially be used to make a good uh, salad dressing for this is the olive slime. Yes. Particularly the Greek olive slime. Yeah. As opposed to the balsamic olive slime. Or olive oil. Yes. Yes. (laughs) Uh, This slime is along the lines of your other slimes. It's a, strain of the green slime but this prefers its subterranean areas and feeds on animals vegetables and metallic substances this slime however though when you come in contact with it it has a numbing poison so you must roll save versus poison to even notice it attached to you Mm -hmm. and there's only and if you don't notice it, there's only a 50% chance that other p- members of your party will notice, but it's one role for the entire party, not individually. Oh, wow. Wow. And you get no adjustments at all outside of any magical bonuses. Then what happens is this stuff spreads itself over the body area that it was exposed to and sends its little parasitic tendrils inside to feed off the fluids of the host. Lovely. Yes, it likes attaching to the spinal area, and then it begins to take over the mind of its host. It becomes the main point of the host, then is to make sure the slime lives. 
Yep. So its main concern is to feed, protect, and aid the growth. So after you've been infected with it and it starts taking over your body, you don't want it removed from you. It's your friend. It's your friend as it's slowly just eating away at you. If you don't intake double your amount of food intake, you start wasting away, losing 10% of your hit points a day. <laughs> mm. Nice. And then Get after to a cleric, quick. <laughs> yeah. And then after 7 to 12 days, the host will be turned into a vegetable creature. The slime creature. Yes. Mm. It be, it be morphs into the slime creature. And then because your skin and muscles start to form a symbiotic uh, attachment to the slime. And at that point, you become a slime creature. Yeah. And then it is just, yeah, you basically are just doomed to be a floric creature attacking adventurers and sucking life out of yeah. them. And I guess and eventually at the end what will happen at the you'll the olive slime then once it breaks everything down uh the slime creature once it breaks down whatever was left it becomes an olive slime so yeah that basically it sounds like the the slime creature is kind of like the intermediary of how the olive slime reproduces right it's it's the caterpillar for the butterfly so to mm-hmm. speak yeah yeah <laughs> Yes. A slimy, olive looking, animal intelligent, want to eat you caterpillar. But hey. <laughs> Fortunately, it's very rare. And Thank its armor class is only nine. However, it can only be harmed by acid, freezing cold, fire, or cure disease. Magic powers which affect plants also work on it, so your druid would be kind of useful. However, mm. other attacks, including spells, do not harm it. So it would not be harmed. By a magic missile? Nope. Lightning bolt? Lightning bolt? Nope. It's acid, cold, fire, or cure disease. So you nail it with a fireball. Right. Including... Nels acid arrow. Got it. Yeah. However, oh, though, oh. By, by the time you're attacking it, it's probably attached to someone. Oh, nice. <laughs> so it becomes... You need a surgical fireball. Mm-hmm. Okay. Get the torch. We're going to burn it off of you. Don't squirm too wow. much. Yeah, yeah. This is worse than the green slime because this is very, very mobile once it attacks you. <laughs> right, right. This is, this is the green slime on the move. <laughs> yes, it is. I'm, I'm also envisioning like, what if your party came across someone that was infected with this slime and but didn't realize it? Oh man. And then wow. the slime starts jumping to the party as they sleep. Or the, oh, and this person slowly transforming into this slime, slime creature. creature. Right. And they, they think wow. something's wrong with them. And they're like, we need to get them to a, a help or whatever. And they're just being eaten to death by a parasite. Mm-hmm. They're just constantly like, I'm so hungry. I need more food. And they're just eating all of the rations of the party. Yeah. This is one of those creatures I could see where you because it takes so long for it to gestate it's over several days. Yeah. Any party that has the ways and means to to do so or is close to a way of curing this thing or getting rid of it, I mean, would find a way rather quickly to do it. I I would as a DM use this thing in an area where access to those things are going to be almost impossible. Right. I mean, this, the, these this are, is going to be like remote places. Yeah, because they're going to be in subterranean areas, and there's no civilization that if they know this olive mm-hmm. slime is in existence, they're just going to burn it all. Right, right. Because this is it's just so nasty. And the last thing you – I could see like maybe someone bringing it back into town where they – like. Maybe like a prospector or something goes mm-hmm. out and he's in the caves. He's chipping away looking for gold and he gets infected by this olive yeah. slime by himself and comes back to town with it. Yeah, I was also even thinking of like uh, almost like a, a lost world kind of setting, you know? Yeah. The party's in like the the land that time forgot. Yeah. You know, they're tr- trudging through those jungles where dinosaurs and other strange creatures are about. And then, and this olive slime creature attacks, and yeah. 
they're on an expedition where the remoteness of it is so much so that an attack from one of these creatures could be deadly for the whole party if they don't have the resources to get rid of it. Right. I mean, I could also see maybe the party is sent out to find someone and they've mm-hmm. been infected by this slime. and They've actually morphed into a slime creature. Oh, and may, oh, so that would be kind of the reverse of it. You're trying to find the the cure for it for somebody. That's the plot. Right. That's the actual adventure in itself. Right. Before they oh. actually become sl- olive slime. So you kind yeah. of have like a I'm infected with this. You know it. I cure me before I become a mindless slime. Now, quick question. Uh, so I'm going to assume that a paladin would be immune to it. Uh, it does not say because, because it's not a disease. Are immune to disease. This is not a disease. Yeah, but a uh, cure disease uh, would 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 get rid of it, right? Right. Cure dis- and that was the so weird we have, thing about it. Yeah. Yeah, because so we have it, to assume then that it is treated as a disease, as a parasitic infection. But it, when it says that it's not harmed by magic power, o- only things that infect plants. Other attacks, including spells, do not harm it. Yeah, but, but, but I think he's saying that. Yeah, if you treated it as a disease. Resistance, to yeah, because cure disease works on it. So right. I, I would rule it. Yes, I would rule it as a disease. I would say a yeah. paladin is immune yeah. to. Yeah, I would too. Yeah, I could see that. You treat it as like a parasitic disease, at which point, yeah, the paladin would be immune to it. Right. Yeah. Now, the other thing I think would be interesting, and this is where I like the idea of what you guys are saying, uh, and especially Nick, you were saying, you know, like you like the idea of this whole lost world. You know, obviously, you know, this thing could be something, you know, in some, you know, far corner, remote, you know, corner of the world uh Mm -hmm. and a very you know primitive area of the world and and the party you know gets maybe one of the members gets infected by it and by the time they realize what's going on there's no they don't know how to get rid of it maybe maybe there is no you know because if there's a paladin in the party i think paladins have uh don't they get to cure disease once a day or something like that i think so okay we'll say the paladin's not in the party uh, say they so don't they, have a paladin, yeah. right? Say right. they don't have a paladin. Say their cleric is uh, is the one infested, and and he can't, Whoa. you know, yeah, uh, he can't do it. He's not no longer in the right state of mind or whatever, you know. Uh, so they go and they find this tribe, right? The Chocho, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, <laughs> the good Chocho, uh, and so you know they say, oh yeah, you know we know what this is. They're they they know what it is, you know, and and they take them to their witch doctor you know and he says yeah i i can heal him you know but you're gonna have to get he gives them this list of things that they have to go out into the jungle and collect you know for him to cast this spell so then they do that and then they they you know they have a little adventure they they manage to get the components for this spell uh they get it back to him he lays the character out on this pyre you know like this uh you know on uh, you know the bunch of sticks right uh, and then he casts a spell, and the character blazes up in fire. Oh. And the party is like, oh, my gosh. Right? You know, they don't know what to do. Uh, and what he's actually casting on the character, as the, as he's assuring them, you know, don't, don't worry, he's fine. You know, and they're watching their party member go up in flames. <laughs> as the shaman uh, says, hey, it's all good. It's, it's all good. good. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Burning away the infection <laughs> is uh, yes. he's cast fire shield, ah, and uh, which to any outsider who didn't know the spell, and which would be pretty much anybody in my game at least who's not a magic user, and mm-hmm. any magic user who doesn't have the spell, right, uh, is uh, you know it's gonna look like he just lit the character on fire. <laughs> <laughs> And fire <laughs> I get to see everybody going, what the hell are you doing? He just, he just I'm curing him on fire <laughs> with and the he, blessed fire. What? <laughs> burning it away, you know, and, and I would think fire shield would get rid of it because it, it's, it's personal effect. Mm-hmm. Uh, it goes outwards, you know, uh, that would be, you know, I, I maybe, Maybe it wouldn't. Maybe they would say the symbiotic 
because you know because it's it's attached itself within you know it's got its tendrils within the player mm-hmm. or within the character maybe within the player within the <laughs> yes, player that's, it takes over a, the player there were that's trouble. a whole another problem <laughs> yes <laughs> but uh but I don't know. I would probably rule that a fire seal could work, though, because I would probably say even, you know, it comes, it literally radiates out from the inner core of the character. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Burning all non, you know, what is not the character, <laughs> right. you know. Including uh, their, say, clothes. Could, could yeah, be. Yeah. So it act- so oh. if, yeah, if you rule that it's coming from the end and anything that's not actually physically part of them Mm -hmm. is not protected then yeah it will have to torch you and all your stuff you'll live but your stuff will be a little charred that's why our person on the pyre is naked yes and that's why they strip them down and and you know that may even have the extra bonus of taking a spell that's fairly powerful and, and making players think about it before they use it. I'm just uh, trying to picture this moment when they all see like the, <laughs> the one I love that all place. Oh, I, I, yeah. I'm in, I'm envisioning. Okay. The witch doctor's like, okay, strip naked. Now lay on these sticks yeah. and then lighting them on fire. <laughs> Uh, you know, and he's drawn all these runes across him, just like in the movie Conan the Barbarian. Yes. Okay. <laughs> You're burning him. No, I'm curing him. It's fine. Oh, no, it's it's fine. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> he's I got to be okay. He's on fire. <laughs> My Nobody's prescri- okay if they're on fire. <laughs> I, I prescribe fire and lots of it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Human Torch. <laughs> Flame on. There you go. <laughs> anyway, though, I just I thought I'd throw that because I, I, oh. I liked what you were saying, Nick, about that. It made me start thinking about that. Yeah. And then I was thinking, you know, wouldn't that be kind of a neat little, you know, I wonder how the I wonder how the players would handle that. They would freak out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they may even try to put the fire out. They, oh, yeah, I was God. just thinking they're grabbing wet blankets. They're throwing sand on them. <laughs> and what a different use for that spell, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, very like, creative. All because of our olive slime. Yeah. Very cool. So uh, Interesting. Yeah. Would never have thought of it if you hadn't brought up olive slime. Olive slime. Right. And the lesser known Greek olive slime, which smells <laughs> like the, the hint of ouzo. Yeah. <laughs> it yes. goes up real fast in flame. Yes, it does. <laughs> it's under <laughs> proof. <laughs> and every time you do it, you say, Opa! Opa! <laughs> All right. I guess on those notes, <laughs> <laughs> we're going to say goodbye for this week and uh, stay tuned next time. So keep it original, keep it old school. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Opa! Podcast is a production of Wild Games Productions in association with d20radio.com. You can visit us at rfipodcast.com or contact us on our forums at osrgaming.org or even by calling us at 570-865-4210. This podcast is produced for entertainment purposes only. All other uses are prohibited. And remember, if your magic missile spell doesn't automatically hit, you're playing the wrong edition. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time on Roll for Initiative. Roll for Initiative.